I'd like to welcome you here today on this 4th of July. Uh, I've got special guests with me. You can see them, but I'll get them to stand up. My whole family stand up. Turn around. Y'all can sit down except for Garrison and, Matt and William. William has just joined the Air National Guard. The reason he doesn't have a uniform, he hasn't been to basic yet. So any of you veterans need to talk to him uh, about going to basic. He's, he's got two drills in with the Air National Guard, wants to be a firefighter. You can sit down, William. Garrison is uh, in Naval ROTC at Auburn University, full scholarship. He wants to fly fast airplanes and land on little bitty postage stamps out in the ocean, <laughs> is what he's desirous to do. But thank, thank both of them. A lot of people, uh, and we saw a few veterans up here, but most of you have no military connection. One of the things I like to do to begin a worship service like this when I have on uniform and, and uh, I preach for an active duty chaplain, and he made me go to Fort Benning and get a uniform that would fit me. Uh, I did not weigh this uh, 20 years ago when I retired. Uh, but now, I've got plenty of room to grow. Uh, <laughs> it's to tell you something about the uniform. And this is called the Army Dress Blue Uniform. Now, if, if you look at the, the sheet that the staff gets, it has LTCOL, Bill Morgan. The reason it has that is that's what your pastor Travis sent them. Now, Travis is absolutely wrong. <laughs> L-T-C-O-L is Air Force. Army is L-T-C, all capital letters, for the same rank, and that's this rank here. In the military, silver always outranks gold. So if you have silver oak leaves, you're a major. If you have silver bars, you're a second lieutenant. First lieutenant has... Uh, has, second lieutenant has a gold bar. Silver has, second lieutenant has a, first lieutenant has a silver. I learn it, I've forgotten it. <laughs> I have no idea, and this is where I was going, what Navy rank means. But my, my grandson is, is going to apply when school starts into the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps rank uses Army rank. So that makes sense to me. So I can tell what he is. I don't know. An ensign. What does that mean? I don't know. But <laughs> that's my rank. You see a lot of things. This thing on my uniform is a combat badge. A lot of people will wear it in, in their uh, camouflage uniforms, and there's so many of those now. They'll wear that, and that will be, if they have them on both sides, it means they've served in combat. This is the 22nd Support Command, and I served in Desert Storm with the 111th Ordnance Group out of Opelika. I was commissioned uh, and then went to seminary, and all of my military duty has been as a chaplain. Uh, served 30 years, that's why I got this stuff. This stuff basically means been there, done there, done that, except for a couple of them. The very, the, the striped one here is a, an Alabama award, and that's the Distinguished Service Medal of Alabama uh, that I, I received. This one, the top two, and it's always by precedent with these little ribbons, and a lot of people ask about, this one is the Meritorious Service Medal, and the little oak leaf things on it means that I was awarded three, three different times. And that's the equivalent to this one. But this one can only be, only be given in wartime. And that's the Bronze Star. Now these, uh, oh, most of them are been there, done there type medals. This one is my unit one, a unit citation in Desert Storm. So I'm authorized to use that. This is the Chaplain Regimental Crest. I have an old one that I wear proudly. It has a cross, and it has a, the tablets, and then it has uh, a little tablets right here. They don't have anything in them right now, 
because there are many more chaplains than Christian and Jewish chaplains uh, now. And, and, but I wear the old one. All of that, if you, if you want to know an officer in the, in the army, they will have a stripe. <laughs> They're easy to spot. <laughs> they have a stripe down their leg uh, in, in a dress uniform. The other thing on my uniform changes everything on my uniform. Just like it should change everything on your heart. And that's this. That's the cross. The cross changes everything. You don't call me. I get paid for being a... I used to get paid. I get retirement pay now in track here for being a lieutenant colonel. That's just the way I got paid. My job was chaplain. So people call me chaplain, not lieutenant colonel. And, and even when you write my name, uh, it's CH, and then in parentheses, they'll have the rank. They'll have LTC. That's how you write my name. The cross takes precedence over everything. That's what I want us to look at today, but I want us to look at it a long time. Before the cross, if you'll turn in your Bibles or turn on whatever you have, iPad, iPhone, Samsung, if you have a phone and don't have a Bible on it, shame on you. Everybody who has a phone needs to have a Bible on it. You can get one free. You can get all kind of translations. There are great resources for you to turn. Turn to Ezekiel Chapter 3, Ezekiel chapter 3, where we're going to focus is on verse 16, and we're going to, we're going to begin there, but we're going to come back to verse 12, so you need to keep your Bibles on. We're only going to look at a couple of verses, so we're not going to, uh, I'm not going to preach this whole chapter. Uh, and I've been known to preach whole chapters of the Bible before. I want to read a couple of verses to you, ver- beginning in verse 16. Now at the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, I have made you a watchman over the house of Israel. When you hear a word from my mouth, give them a warning from me. If I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, but you do not warn him You don't speak out to warn him about his wicked way in order to save his life. That wicked person will die for his iniquity. Yet, I will hold you responsible for his blood. But if you warn the wicked person and he turns, that's good. That's a short paraphrase. Then he talks about the same thing for a righteous person. If a righteous person is doing something wrong... You need to warn them about it. If they turn, you're great. But if you don't warn them, you're responsible. That that puts church discipline in a completely different light, doesn't it? That puts evangelism in a completely different light. I'd like for us to look at some of these and, and see, in, in 16 and 17, the word of the God came to me and said, I have made you a watchman. That doesn't sound like a suggestion to me. That doesn't sound like God is saying to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, if it's convenient and you want to, you can do it. I'm afraid people have separated two words that are the part of the same coin of salvation. One of the word is Savior. We like to think of Jesus as our Savior, and He is. He saves us from the penalty of death. God's mercy toward us doesn't give us what we deserve, eternal separation from Him, because we're all sinners. He saves us by His grace. He gives us something we don't deserve, and that's heaven. How in eternal life. That's praise. But we can't make him Savior, and he won't be Savior unless he is Lord. He comes to us, and he takes over, or he's not in us at all. Lord means 
boss. Lord means commander. Now, when I, my last job as a chaplain, I worked for a two-star general, several of them. Uh, one of them, you might know, he was uh, uh, in charge. He, he, well, he was over this as a general. It was part of the unit, and that's Joel Norman. Uh, Joel Norman was a major general when he retired. I knew him when he was a major. <laughs> I knew him, and he rode around with me when he, uh, when he, before he became battalion commander, and I started out in a field artillery unit in the Alabama National Guard in field artillery. He was going to have control, commander of the artillery battalion after annual training, after our two-week summer camp. He rode around with me and said, Bill, I want you to keep me out of trouble. Uh, because you keep telling me I'm not the commander yet. Keep my mouth shut. <laughs> because no two commanders do things the same way. Well, as, as we look at that, he would call me in and he would, he, he would say, Bill, I want you to do something. And I say, oh, Joel, I don't want to do that. that. That's too much trouble. Don't make me do that. Uh, I'd say, sir, I'm not qualified to do that. Uh, if it was something that I couldn't do as a chaplain, then I'd confront him with that. But if it was in my area, what would I do? Yes, sir. And then I would go off and do however I wanted to. <laughs> I tried over and over and over to tell young lieutenants who were presenting things to him that he could add and subtract. You see, he was a mathematician. That was his job. <laughs> they would have a slide at the first of a briefing, military show and tell, and a slide at the end or the middle of a briefing and have numbers on them. If those numbers didn't mesh and match, he'd want to know why. What's the discrepancy here? You said we had this many vehicles, then this many need repair. And then you said we had this many. Well, he, he thought he, he did good, but I got him one time, and I got to tell you this. They talked about something we had in the National Guard that regulations say you can't have. We had a helicopter that we called a hangar queen, and we took parts off of her to fix other helicopters <laughs> because they were missing a part that was on back order, and as long as that helicopter was sitting there, they'd take parts and order a different part until she finally got fixed. And in the briefing, they gave the tell number of that helicopter. The next drill, he and I were going to visit a unit, and I had a little sheet of paper, and I got my little sheet of paper out, and I walked to the back of the helicopter, and I looked at the tell, and he said, Chaplain, what in the world are you doing? I said, Sir, I'm not getting on that hanger queen. I got the tell number written down. He said, give me that sheet of paper. <laughs> and he wrote it down. When he said do something, I did it because I knew he would check. God has appointed us as watchmen. You don't believe it? Let me give you some passages of scripture. Try Matthew 28, 19 through 20. You ought to know that. Uh, go make disciples of everybody. Mark 16, 15. Luke 24, 48 through 49. John 20, 21. And Acts 1, 8. You shall be my witnesses. Are we on commission? Absolutely. Are we on mission for God? Absolutely. God has appointed us watchman. As we look at that appointment, we need to take it seriously. We need to recognize who we work for. Who do you work for? Do you work for a boss? Now, I'm an Uber driver. Uh, my wife is legally blind and I'm her Uber driver. <laughs> I have one customer and she doesn't pay very well. She doesn't tip at all, but, but I'm her driver. Uh, and that's why she has the glasses on. For six years, she could not see my facial features until she got these glasses that she's wearing. Now she can. She doesn't know if that's good or bad, but, but we're somewhere in between there. We, we recognize 
We're under divine appointment. The next part of that verse says, when you hear a word from my mouth. Now we're going to go back. We're going back to verse 12. The Spirit lifted me up, and I heard a loud rumbling sound behind me. Bless the glory of the Lord in His place. And with the sound of the living creatures, wings brushing against each other, and the sound of the wheels beside them, a loud rumbling sound. The Spirit lifted me up and took me away. He left me in bitterness. I left in bitterness and in an angry spirit. And the Lord's hand was on me powerfully. I came to the exiles of Tel Aviv who were living in the Shebar Canal. And I sat down there among them, stunned. For seven days. What does it take to hear a word from God? You're looking at the prophet. Elijah. Elisha and Elijah were co-prophets. Hearing a word from God. You'll look at that as you study that. Now when I think of Elijah. And when I think of doing that. I've got, I've got a different thought. That just pops in my mind. Because we did CPR at the associational office. And the one who taught the CPR said, Daddy, we don't need to use uh, the one we usually use when I teach CPR. That's another one bites the dust. She said, I don't think that's appropriate at this other. At the, so we looked and got a song that you do when you do CPR. And we chose Days of Elijah. <laughs> These are the days of Elijah. And, and you learn that song and you sing that song and the rapid cadence of that song is how you do the chest compressions. As I hear that song, as I see a word from God, I remember there was a mighty wind and God wasn't in the wind. There was a rumbling of the earthquake and God wasn't in the earthquake. There was a lightning thunderstorm and God wasn't in there. But then there was a still, small voice that was the voice of God. It's amazing how God can speak to us when we're listening for Him. I'm afraid, church, we're too busy sometimes even doing church things that we don't listen to God. Um, vacation Bible School is great. I don't know how many volunteers you had to teach in your vacation Bible school. I hope every one of them listened to God. And I hope you're not one who God said, I want you to help, and you didn't. A church should never look for teachers and leaders and workers. Because I believe God is speaking to people to do those things. And they say, no, God. I, I can't do that, God. He's not our Lord unless we follow Him. It's doing what God wants to do. It's preparing ourselves to hear a word from God. A person must stay alert and face reality. One of my daddies, and my daddy was a World War II veteran. He had a, a badge similar to the gentleman back here that's wearing today that you need to thank him. It's called a CIB, Combat Infantry Badge. It's a rifle on a blue field. And my daddy had one of those. He, was, he, he helped uh, rescue the 101st Airborne at Bastogne. He was with Patton. The 101st said they don't need rescuing. They could have made it themselves. But my daddy said we rescued them. They were in trouble before we got there. <laughs> different sides. His favorite story was on guard duty. He was alert. Man came up to, to where he was on guard duty, and he, it was at Fort Knox. And if you know anything about Fort Knox, they store something at Fort Knox. Gold. Uh, and he was on guard duty. And a high-ranking officer came up and didn't have the correct credentials to go where he wanted to go. And he, told, he finally said to my daddy, well, what are you going to do if I just drive on through? He said, I can't stop you. All I'm going to do is fire a round in the air, and that machine gun at the next location that you can't see right now is going to wipe you out. 
he said he changed his attitude real quick. He was aware of the reality of the situation. He was alert. He knew what his job was. When you accepted Jesus Christ as personal Savior, you got the greatest gift in the world, salvation. But you also got another gift, if you're a Christian, a spiritual gift. A gift he expects you to use in his service. As a watchman, we're supposed to be aware of the reality of our situation, aware of the giftedness God has given us, and use us. Now, my wife and I, since we retired, have started teaching ESL. Anybody here know what ESL is? ESL should be English as a second language. I don't teach that. I teach English as a southern language. <laughs> Most of my students speak better English than I do. I teach the advanced level. Uh, they know more grammar than I know. I, it, it's been, I won't tell you, it's been a long time since I studied grammar uh, in, in high school and college English. I don't, you know, they say partis- I don't know what a participle is. I don't know any of that stuff. Anyway, I'm teaching them to hear. Now, why would I do that? Because I believe God has equipped me because most of my students are military spouses. Last year, I had a lady from Croatia. I had a lady from Spain. I had a lady from South Korea in my class whose husbands were at Air War College. Air War College at Maxwell means they're very senior and they're probably going to make general. I share something with them. Two years ago, I had a Buddhist lady. She told me in our home, she's, I asked her about her religious background. She said, I'm a Buddhist. Her husband was, didn't say anything. He's, he was military. He didn't say anything. I said, you know, Christianity and the military are a lot alike. She said, what? I said, yeah, your husband's going to Air War College. That won't get him promoted automatically. Your husband has has done a good job, I assume, to be in Air War College. That won't get him promoted. Your husband meets all the requirements, but there are other people who meet all the requirements. How is your husband going to be promoted to general? Somebody on his promotion board who knows him is going to say, I want this guy promoted. And the more senior that person is, the more likely he'll be promoted. That's just how it works. It's all about who you know and who knows you. What's Christianity? It's not about what you do in church. It's not about your family. It's not about your education. It's not about how much Bible you know or memorize. It's all about one thing. Do you know Jesus? Now, I know Kay Ivey. Every time I see her on television, I recognize who she is. My son works for her. He's on, at the beach now, and, and, or he would have been here with his family, but I couldn't order him, but I could order his, his wife and she'd listen to me. <laughs> He's over the grounds for the state capitol. He works in Kay Abbey's backyard. Uh, she knows him. He knows her. If I'm, when I see her, and I've seen her a couple, I say, I'm Matthew's mother, daddy. And he says, I know who you are. Yes, Matthew's doing a great... She knows him. I'm afraid there are too many church members who know about Jesus. But they don't know Jesus. And you can tell because he's not the Lord of their life. If you know Jesus, he's in charge. He's the Lord of your life. He knows you better than you know yourself. Therefore, he can tell you things to do that you say, I can't do that, but I'm available and I'll try. And that's where we see the glory of God. The prophet heard a word from God. The next part of that verse 17 says, give a warning. Ezekiel 3 and Ezekiel 33 use the same wording. But in 33, when it says, give a warning, it says, blow the trumpet. Let people know. How are we to give the warning? 
by sharing the gospel. By sharing that our salvation is not based on works, but based on our faith and God's grace and God's mercy. We share the warning by telling people about Jesus. We don't have to change anybody. Had a first sergeant in field artillery. Every drill he would ask me, he said, Chaplain, how many souls have you saved this month? And I said, I hadn't seen any. Everybody I saw was connected to a body. Thank goodness. <laughs> We're all people. Uh, we have, and I've, I've had people from all over the world who have come through ESL, and the same needs, the same uh, basic makeup, the same hunger for a relationship to God. Folks, we've got the best news in the world. Now, I started to show the video, but I, I refrained. I've got the video of me swearing in this grandson into the Air National Guard. Uh, do I tell people about that? Do I show that to people? Absolutely. Do I show pictures of my family to people? Absolutely. Why? I'm proud of them. They're important to me. I love, I could tell grandchildren stories. I got nine grandchildren. I could tell the grandchildren stories the rest of the afternoon. You'd probably get bored after about a minute or two, but they're not boring to me. They're important to me. When's the last time you shared the gospel? You say the gospel is the most important thing in your life. When have you shouted the warning? When have you told people about Jesus and the difference he can make? He'll change them. You don't save any souls. You don't save any people. That's the work of God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will convict them of sin. The Holy Spirit will draw them to Jesus. Jesus' death on the cross is enough. Christ and Christ alone for salvation. That's good news, folks. And we need to be sharing it. We can talk about a lot of different things, but some people say, I just can't talk about that. Why? If you meet K.I.V., would you tell anybody about it or would you keep it a secret? You met Jesus. <laughs> How much important is Jesus than the governor of the state of Alabama? <laughs> you met Jesus. We ought to be able to talk about him. I wish I could stop there. It would be much easier, but I can't because 20C and uh, several places it, it following says, if you don't, if you don't sound the warning, if you don't tell people they're in trouble, they're going to die if they don't follow me, I'll hold you responsible. Now, what does that mean? It's important that we look at the, the back of that, understanding the Hebrew. That die is physical death. The people hearing this were in Babylonian captivity. The people hearing this had been asked by the Babylonians, had asked themselves a basic question. And, and I'd ask Micah this. Can you sing the Lord's song in a strange land? We've hung our harps up because they said, Jews in Jerusalem, the only place you can worship God is in Jerusalem. You can't worship Him in Babylon. We live in a culture that say more and more you can only worship God in church. You can't worship Him in the workplace. You can't worship Him in the marketplace. You can't worship Him wherever you are. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. We have the internationals in our home quite often. And several years ago, my wife had a Muslim student. And she always gives little nativities made by Worldcraft uh, from Alabama WMU. She gives those little, and she was worried, how in the world, I, I don't want to leave her out, but I'm, I said, go on and give it to her and see what happens. She gave this Muslim lady a nativity. The Muslim lady asked more questions, was 
happier to receive the gift and learn about Jesus and Jesus than any of the others who thought they were Christian but didn't have a relationship, a life-changing relationship to Jesus Christ. Uh, It's amazing how God can use things to open up the gospel. We've got to be more creative Christians in the way we share the gospel. We've got to show an extra step and an extra amount of kindness to people. One of the, and I see Diane and me and our whole team at TGSL as ambassadors for the United States. Because people around the world get their idea about the United States from what they see on the TV or movies and what they hear on the music. That's their perception of the United States. And when they get here and we invite them to our home and they see we're just ordinary folks who, who love our family, who, who have high values, but also who respect them and who listen to them and who try to help them. This Buddhist lady had a, a problem. She had a son. And, and in a lot of countries, the first place you go is an emergency room. Well, she took her son to the emergency room at Prattville Hospital, which is the worst place to go for an ear infection. (laughs) You don't go to the emergency room for an ear infection. or It was something like that. And and the billing was wrong, and her insurance was not going to cover it. So she called me, and I said, let me see what's going on. So I called and and talked to the, the person in administration who did the coding. And she'd put it down wrong on the coding. And all they had to do was change the coding and get it, got it fixed, or insurance covered it. But you know what she said to me? You know, it's not about, who you know, about what you know, it's about who you know, isn't it? I said, absolutely. You need to know Jesus. We can use all kinds of creative ways to help people know about Jesus when we're willing to do that. He will hold us accountable. We must give an account. Uh, this language of death was death in Babylon. It was not eternal separation from God. But the Bible says in Matthew sixteen nineteen and Matthew eighteen eighteen, the Bible says something there, Jesus says something there that we need to listen to very carefully. He says, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom, the gospel. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been bound before. It's amazing the power that God has given us with the gospel. God expects us to share the gospel. Realizing that if we don't share the gospel with an individual and we don't know, that guy could go to hell. Now, I can look. You ought to be able to look and tell I'm military. I can look at, and I love the white uniform of the Navy. We're going after after service today we're going back to travel we're going to go through milo's and my grandson is going he's got a test he's going to drive and eat a milo's burger in the white uniform and see how how long that white uniform lasts just a little test we've got for him to see see if he's real navy yet or not (laughs) i don't think i could wear a white uniform i'd have gotten it dirty on the way to church this morning uh but i can tell by the uniform they wear You can tell who a firefighter is by the uniform they wear. You can tell by a police officer by the uniform they wear. How do you tell a Christian? When I was in Saudi Arabia, I never went to a local church because I had to wear a uniform. And on my uniform collar, I had a cross. I could meet them in restaurants. I could talk to them. Uh, I helped get them some Bibles. Uh, I could do a lot of ministry with local church. But there was a $10,000 bounty on the head of the pastor. You were careful who you invited to church. 
Because if they turned in the pastor, they got $10,000. Uh, how many of you would turn in your pastor? No. <laughs> there were a bunch in my congregations when I paid pastor 24 years that would have turned me in for $10,000. But as, we, as I look at that, I got a question. How do you know who to invite? How do you prove you're a Christian? It's not by how much Bible you can quote. It's not by if you answer yes or no to some questions. How do you show you're a Christian? If Jesus is Savior of your life, He will be Lord of your life. And you will live a biblical lifestyle. That means there are some things you can't do. That means there are some things you should do. That means... You don't want to connect, and, and, and one of the things that the Bible is, is strong on is, is our witness. You don't want to join with people that destroys your witnesses or have a perception of evil. When I was a pastor, I had a rule, and I stood by it firmly. I did not visit in the home of women who were not twice my age or half my age. Now, half is easy to do now, but twice would be a little difficult. 140, you don't find many of those uh, running around. But, but as, as I, and I did not ever touch money. I did not do that. I had some things that I would do and some things that I would not do to avoid the perception of evil. Our church in Glencoe was very close to a funeral home, and I would do funeral service for veterans. A lot of World War II veterans dying during that time. And, and I did a lot of funeral service where it was me, the funeral director, and a very small number of family members. I depended on the funeral director, and he did a good job of this, to tell the family they could not pay me anything, period, when I put on a military uniform. When I had on my uniform, I was working for Uncle Sam. And I, I got comp time, they called it, for it for chaplains to do that. I didn't get paid for it. I just got extra time. And as, we, as, as I did that, there was never a problem with that because I refrained from the appearance of evil. In our society today, what you put on Facebook, Snapchat, any of the social medias, people can read that and form an opinion on you just like that. Christian, who controls your social media? Do you control it? Or does Jesus control it? We live in a difficult time here. You're called to be a watchman. Let's just do that. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this opportunity to focus on your word. Thank you for calling Ezekiel as a watchman. Help us, God, that we might be watchmen, always on alert, ready to sound the warning, listening to you, and knowing that we're accountable for you. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for helping us through the presence of your Holy Spirit. I pray that if there's one here today who thinks they've made you Savior, but you're not Lord of their life, they might change things and start reading your word and following your word. Forgive us, God, when we play a game with you and think we can get by with it. We can't. Help us, God, that we might be accountable to you and accountable to each other as we seek to serve you together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.